Um, we're reading through the book of Acts uh, during this uh, Pentecost season, um, and we come to this morning to Acts chapter 3. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried uh, into the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And taking him by the right hand, he helped him up and instantly The man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As many of you know, Julie and I and Michelle spent the last two weeks in Portland for the General Conference of the United Methodist Church. It's a little bit of an arduous task. On Friday morning, uh, we were woefully behind as we always are. Uh, and I rose and I made a motion on the floor and uh, it was that we needed to reduce the limit on speeches down to two each and reduce the time of the speeches from three minutes to two minutes. And what I said after I made that motion was that the children's lesson and the anthem have run long, it's time to cut the sermon. That's this morning, too, (laughs) just so you know. (laughs) It was a wonderful place to to be. Uh, We spent most of it inside the convention center, though. Uh, But on Sunday, last Sunday, while you were in worship, you and I got an opportunity to go out up to Multnomah Falls, and we were stunned by the natural beauty of the Pacific Northwest. It it really is, especially to a flatlander, it's amazing. The city of Portland itself is a, is a wonderful place. Uh, it is an efficient light rail system that puts our own to shame. All kinds of interesting nooks and crannies on, on both sides of the river that flows through the city of Portland. What I was not prepared to encounter is that Portland is a city with an incredibly large number of homeless people living on the streets downtown, hundreds of them. Most of them are young people, some of them drawn by uh, Portland's uh, policy of non-harassment of street people, others drawn, I suspect, by the rather liberal uh, drug laws in the state of Oregon. Um, The uh, cannabis uh, marijuana is free, it's not free, It it is legal there, Uh, And across the street from the convention center was a shop called Oregon's Finest Cannabis, uh, which may explain some of what happened at the general conference. (laughs) I saw perhaps more long hair than I have witnessed since the 1970s. Uh, But there are lots of older folks living on the streets as well. Um, There were uh, some of them, I'll put this down so you guys are not blocked as much. Uh, Some of them suffering from mental illness, as is often the case. Uh, Some of them just there by the circumstances of their lives. Uh, Julianne met one older woman, 67, who just needed $18 to get her medication uh, in order to stop trembling. Uh, They gave a rather personal face, to me at least, 
of the man in the story from the book of Acts this morning. Because he too was a street person. A man who had been crippled since his birth, uh, who, who went to the temple courts every day, but not to pray. He went there to ask for handouts. We don't know this guy's name. Let's just call him Chester in homage to a really old TV western. You won't get this one at all, Mike. (laughs) Chester lived in a society which, unlike our own, had no social safety nets, no laws to protect the the rights of the handicapped, no ADA enforcement, uh, not even any social disapproval for those who might discriminate against you. That meant with no training, uh, no transportation, no light rail system, no visible means of support. He ended up doing that, which others also ended up doing. Others who were lame or blind or physically disabled. He became a professional beggar, eking a living off of the charity of others. But there's the funny thing about that kind of life, because if, if all you ever are in life is a taker and never a giver, it begins to affect your outlook on everything else. You get really stingy, for instance, uh, possessive of whatever you do have. Some time ago, a, cost, a, a contest was held to find out who, the, who is the greediest rich person in America. They selected the top billionaires from across the country. Uh, They sent them each a check from a dummy corporation called the National Refund Center, each in the amount of $1.35. Half of the billionaires cashed the check. So they reduced the amount, sent out new checks, 58 cents. 30 billionaires cashed that check. So they had a kind of a grand (laughs) greed-off. They sent out checks for 17 cents. Two men cashed those checks. Adnan Khashoggi, the Saudi Arabian arms dealer, and no politics intended here, Donald Trump. (laughs) 17 cents. Now, he probably didn't cash it. Probably somebody opened it for him and put it into his account. But when you are a taker in life and not a giver, it shapes your attitudes. Not only get greedy, you begin to look at people from one question, uh, not what are their needs, uh, but what can they do for you? What can you do for me? You start to evaluate institutions on the same basis. You figure out quickly which churches are going to give you food and which churches are going to make you listen to the sermon first. Even with strangers, you develop a a radar that can sense this is a person that's going to be an easy mark, this one's going to be hard-hearted, and won't even give me the time of day. And then to, to, to get what you want, you think nothing about lying and even trying to play upon the sympathies of Christians. You write on your little handmade sign, uh, God bless you for helping me. Several years ago when I served a different church in, in, in the city, uh, a man came to my office one day who pretended that he couldn't talk at all. He would wrote messages on a piece of paper asking for money. I called down to our social ministries to see whether they knew anything at all about this guy. I found out he'd already hit up the Catholic Church. Not only that, but that the priest there had recorded his first miracle when he refused to help the man and the the mute man muttered a curse as he left. (laughs) If all you are in life is a taker and not a giver, for you, life is one big scam, one continuous hustle. That's what the life of this lame man was like. His existence had been reduced to being carried or really probably drugged on his mat. This guy had a drug problem. (laughs) Uh. (laughs) Drugged on his mat to one of the temple gates, the one that led to the court of women 
where the poor boxes were kept. These were the same boxes, by the way, that the poor widow that only had two little mites put the money in and Jesus saw and commented on it. There were, it's a gate located right by the temple treasury. It was so magnificent with 75-foot brass doors uh, that covered it. It was known as the gate called beautiful. It was there the fellow sat, begging for people passing from the outer court of the Gentiles, where anybody could be, to the inner courts of the temple itself. So when he saw Peter and John coming to the temple, he did what he always did. No matter who, no, no, no matter when, he, he hit them up for a contribution. Hey, buddy, can you spare a denarius? That's all he wanted. That's all he expected. That's all he even thought to ask for. And then Peter said, you, look at me. Eyes up here, look at me. I don't have any money. But in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And that's what the man did. He not only walked, lame since birth, he went running. And then he went leaping. He was praising God. It's not even the whole story. See, Peter and John gave him something more than just that. First of all, what they gave him was their interest, their concern. They stopped long enough to show this man that they cared about him. That in and of itself must have made an impression on him. Somebody brought him to the temple every day. But nobody drug him inside to pray, just outside to beg. He never got inside because nobody bothered to take him there. Or he might have begun to understand that life is more than just living off the handouts of other people. And I wonder if you and I are guilty of the same thing sometimes. We're a little embarrassed uh, but because, you know, faith is so personal. So we'll, we'll talk to people. We'll go see them. If they're in the hospital, we'll go visit them. But we won't pray for them because that's, that's, you don't want to be a fanatic, right? Nobody likes fanatics unless it's sports fanatics. And then it's Okay. You can even whoop in church if they say the name of your college. <laughs> Peter and John saw a lame man. They didn't shy away. But they didn't just give him a dollar. They gave him their attention. They said, you know what? You may not know it, but you are a child of God. You are worthy of my time. You are deserving of my attention. Because God loves you, whether you know it or not. Sometimes, that's what we need to give people. That attention, that reminder of who they really are. But second, Peter and John also gave this man a future very different from all the limitations of his past. We all need chances for that, don't we? I told the, told the seniors at this last service, I'm, I remember this. There, it's a great time to be a high school senior, isn't it? Isn't that the best time in your life? Because there is no creature so gloriously self-absorbed on the face of the earth as a graduating high school senior. The world is their oyster. <laughs> and it should be. And it's okay. Because the world will take it back soon enough. Nothing is greater than a high school senior. Nothing is lower than a college freshman. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just a few days which separates those two. It's amazing. 
the world will get it back. So sooner or later, we're going to need a chance to start over, every one of us. Peter and John came along and gave to a beggar that only knew how to, how to lay by the side of the road a future. Not as a taker, but as a forgiven and healed child of God. How great it is when we give people that, that same future. But the most important thing they offered him that day was not just a chance to start over, and it wasn't the silver and gold that he was looking for. It was, they offered him Jesus Christ. It strikes me, this is so interesting, that he sat by the gate called Beautiful. The gate called Beautiful. I wonder how many people sit by a gate called Beautiful today thinking that if they just get enough riches and gold and silver and acclamation and affirmation, that they're going to have a happy life. The gate called Beautiful has all the beautiful things of the world around it. But until until we offer people Christ. None of that will matter. The only way to be happy is to know Jesus. That's who Jesus, who Peter and John offered the lame man. The result was the first specific miracle that the book of Acts that we're reading during this season tells us was performed by the disciples after Pentecost. Uh, Read it again. This man who had been crippled, who had been lame for over 40 years all of his life, this man got up and began to walk and leap and praise God. And don't you think that livened up the prayer meeting that afternoon in the temple at 3 o'clock? It would liven up our services, wouldn't it? I thought sometimes of just buying some crutches and, and, and just laying them around here, you know, somewhere. Some folks would come in and say, wow, people get healed at that church. <laughs> they just leave their crutches and they go home. <laughs> but maybe they really should get healed at this church. I know we're a Methodist church. I know we don't do crazy things, right? We, we, we do them, but it takes us legislatively a long time. <laughs> Peter and John offered the man Christ. The man discovered that Jesus is all that anyone ever really needs because there is power in his name, there is healing in his name, there is life in his name. Are we offering those, these things to people Are we just digging in our hands and tossing them a hand out? It is so incredibly easy to get it confused. It's said that Thomas Aquinas, the great theologian of the Middle Ages, once called upon Pope Innocent II when the Pope was counting a large sum of money. And the Pope said, you see, Thomas, the church can no longer say, silver and gold have I none. To which Thomas replied, true Holy Father, and neither can she now say, rise up and walk. giving folks what they asked for? Or can we give them more than they had spent? Can we give them Jesus? Parting words of John Wesley to Thomas Coke as he sailed to America, 1782, to join with Francis Asbury in establishing the Methodist movement on these shores was simply offer them Christ. Offer them Christ. Uh, are we offering people that? Likewise, have, have, have you and I come to the place this morning looking only for a little spiritual handout, a little religious snack to tide us over when what the Father would like to give us today is nothing less than the Spirit of God Himself? Maybe we've not been asking too much, but too little. Too temporal, too temporary, too mortal, too mundane. It happened long ago when a beggar asked two strangers for a handout but got more than he asked for. Because in the name of Jesus, he was healed. In the name of Jesus, he was restored. In the name of Jesus, he was made whole. In the name of Jesus, he was given a new life. 
It's no wonder that the very next verse of this chapter tells us that the man clung to Peter and John. He didn't want to go anywhere without them. Later on, what we read is we find out that, that right at this place, at the, right on the temple steps, uh, right by the gate called Beautiful, Solomon's Porch, where that miracle took place, the Christian church began to be born and to grow right there. Because all who saw it were filled with amazement and wonder. May I tell you, they still will be. When they see Jesus Christ healing through us, broken legs and broken bones, broken hearts, broken marriages, broken relationships, broken lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, Let's rise up and walk. Let's pray together. Father, we give you thanks that no matter how low in life we may be, when you come along, you just simply say, look at me. And when we do, we find life. In the name of Jesus, amen.